Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Next Supply Chain Challenge, Syringes, presented by Appaject. I'm Ross Yule, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Ed Kelly, PhD, Chief Global Health Officer, Appaject, and Omer Ahmed, Chief Strategy Officer, Nexus Pharmaceuticals. You can read their full bios on the left side of your window by selecting the speakers tab. Just a few technical notes before we begin. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your volume is up. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. Okay, now let's begin. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Kelly. And the first question- My pleasure, Ed, Ross. Yeah, great, great to have you, Ed. And the first question we have is, what is the current situation on COVID vaccinations? And where are we seeing the biggest bottlenecks in countries? Thanks, Ross, and uh, thanks for hosting us uh, today. And it's great to be with such a, an illustrious panel. Well, first off, I think we should just take a, the temperature for a minute about where we are in the entire pandemic. We have uh, over 250 million cases to date in the pandemic, over 5 million deaths. We passed that terrible mark recently. And unfortunately, a lot of countries have scaled back their testing for COVID. Uh, for a variety of reasons. So actually those numbers are probably much bigger. Uh, so we put a lot of faith into the vaccine programs around the world to get us out of the, the pandemic. And the state of vaccination uh, for COVID is, I would have to give it at the moment, probably a C uh, at best. 53% of the world has gotten one dose. Uh, and as we know, that's not being fully vaccinated. We've given out uh, almost 8 billion, about 7.7 .7 billion doses. So that's nearly, that's double what we normally do in terms of vaccinations uh, every year. Uh, but only 5% of uh, vaccinations have happened in low and middle income countries. So there's, there's big differences even within regions. If uh, I'm located in Europe uh, uh, and working with a lot of European partners, there's a lot of variation there. Where, where I live in France, there's, uh, it's between 70 and 80 percent vaccinated, but other parts of the region, some countries, Russia and Eastern Europe, uh, are around 30 percent vaccinated. So very low vaccination rates uh, driving uh, increases in uh, in cases, but then you take a place like Ghana, which is actually one of the bright spots as a healthcare system in Africa, and it's only 8% vaccinated. So um, the other issue that you have, Ross, is that out of, outside of this wide variation in terms of countries having access to vaccines is the issue of uh, the fact that in some countries you have a big populations that have only gotten one dose. For instance, in India, 26% uh, of the population, which is a lot of people have only gotten one dose. And this leaves uh, big groups of people vulnerable to perhaps creating a, a, a new variant, a, a vaccine resistant variant. And last point I'll, I'll make just on the, where are we on COVID vaccinations? Um, or around boosters. Right now, big booster programs, kind of third dose that is, being rolled out in high income, most high income countries. Uh, we've now given out more booster doses in high income countries than we have given out even first doses in low income countries. So that's about 71 million booster doses given out and only about 43 million uh, doses given out in some of the low income countries. And you know, this all gets back to promise, some of the promises not being kept in terms of the global rollout. Uh, we had promised about 
um, nearly 2 billion doses to be given out uh, between this year and next. And we've only donated about 250 million doses. So long way to go. Uh, 2022 will be big crunch time uh, for us in terms of global COVID vaccines. Great. Thanks so much, Ed. So our second question is syringe shortages are being talked about more and more in the media. How real is the problem and why do we not see this coming earlier? Yeah, great question. I had a, a reporter recently ask me about this and say, wait, you mean when we give out vaccines, we don't give out syringes with them? And actually, uh, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and the third organization that's involved in uh, vaccinations globally, the UN uh, uh, UNFPA, the Family Planning uh, um, Organization, has um, long had a policy that every dose needs to go with a syringe, but that's not the policy we're following necessarily in the COVID times. Um, we talked about it, I and some of my colleagues last summer, um, together with uh, Margaret Chan, who's the former Director General of WHO, uh, saying that we're not thinking enough about syringes. There's not a big program on it, and that's going to result in syringe shortages and a, a whole bunch of problems that go with it. Um, unfortunately, nobody really listened uh, at the time, and only just recently, in the past uh, two weeks, you had WHO and UNICEF coming out with statements that were probably going to be uh, at least two billion syringes short. But that is a number. If, if uh, folks have seen that, that is based on uh, auto disable syringes only. So, so specialty syringes that UNICEF distributes in the developing world. It's based on the low income countries, which UNICEF services. And it's not based on a calculation of potential boosters. So we're easily looking at four to five billion syringes uh, short over the course of the, uh, uh, the course of the vaccination program. And yeah, why we didn't think about it. Um, you know, Ross, there are so many things we are, did not think through on this uh, COVID response. This is just one of them. There's a bit of magical thinking out there. I think this is part of it that says, look, the world needs to spend money on the upstream stuff, the basic science, i.e. The, the new vaccines. And then um, it's really up to countries to get it into the arms of people. But uh, many countries struggled, are struggling with and struggled with the vaccine rollout. It's happening in Europe and it's, it'll happen in uh, the US, but it'll certainly happen in the developing world. Um, we had other complications like the Delta variant and other things coming uh, as well, export restrictions in some countries that have cons constrained syringe supply. But the bottom line is that uh, we didn't think about the last mile enough when we started thinking about this COVID vaccination campaign. Got it. Thanks, Ed. So related to that question, um, what are the issues we are seeing in boosting supply of syringes? Yeah, that is, it's a great question. That's the um, uh, issue that uh, we have in terms of uh, syringe supply. You know, in fact, the big crunch is actually coming. Um, because we've done such a poor job of vaccinating most of the world and the places where syringes are in the shortest supply, um, we did have a gap uh, where it took us a bit to get uh, the vaccine programs going where syringe manufacturers ramped up their work. And they've told us, we did a recent piece in the Washington Post uh, that looked at the syringe shortage. And manufacturers told us that they had really tried to expand existing lines uh, repurpose lines where they were able to to focus on vaccine size syringes um, to the tune of maybe five to six billion uh, additional syringes out there. And there were some in the stockpiles, but everywhere you talk to, whether it's the global health organizations like uh, UNICEF or the Pan American Health Organization that actually distributes syringes, or you talk to countries themselves or syringe manufacturers, everyone says the stock are done and all available lines are running basically 24 seven. So 
we've squeezed what we're going to get out of the existing infrastructure out there and building new lines, you know, it takes a year uh, at least. And, and, you know, Omar and others can, we can talk more about this. Um, you can't uh, build that uh, overnight. So um, we'll have trouble uh, getting more syringes out there. And remember that every time we borrow or use existing syringes, we're squeezing routine immunizations. Many more children will die from measles the coming year because they didn't get their measles shot than will die uh, from COVID. So um, there's a zero sum game out there that's really gonna be a tough one to play uh, in 2022. Got it, thanks Ed. So our following question is, what are we seeing in terms of the roles of public and private sector in terms of supply chain bottlenecks and especially for syringes? Yeah, this is an, an interesting point. Um, there, I've been involved with a number of outbreaks. Uh, I've joined Apigec relatively recently and used to work uh, for a decade and a half at the World Health Organization, was part of the Ebola response in 2014, part of the Zika response following that. Um, there's always, uh, after each uh, outbreak, people, you know, the great and the good gather around and say, uh, well, we must figure out ways that this will never happen again. Um, and each time it's, you know, a new version has happened again. But um, this time around, the magic wand that people are waving is local production and, and public-private partnerships to encourage uh, local production of back, bulk vaccine, uh, but also other parts of the supply chain. And, uh, you know, while the focus on patent waivers and, and producing vaccines in Africa is, I, I think, a bit misguided in the sense that it'll take quite a while for us to get up to speed on that, I do think there's a lot of potential for, for public and private uh, um, sector partnerships, particularly on fill finish and syringe manufacturing, but uh, fill finish in general um, in uh, many parts of the world, whether it's Southeast Asia or Africa that haven't traditionally produced this. And the, the issue that has happened in the past, whether it's vaccine, trying to build up a local vaccine production or other fill finish capacity has been that it's been driven by public sector money or foundation money and public sector decision making. And by definition, uh, both of those are finite in their, in their uh, funding uh, scheme. So the difference now, I was just on the phone, for instance, with colleagues from Ghana, where we have some, um, some partnerships, and there's a real interest in the private sector taking the lead role on you know, choosing the site, getting partners, looking for funding, and the public sector role is back to where it's really best suited, sort of setting some of the regulations, helping create the right environments, helping assist with um, favorable loans or, or other uh, financing and, and regulatory pieces. And also, let's be frank, investing in some of the pieces that will make these ventures sustainable. You need a trained workforce, so you cannot build major fill finish work or even other vaccine production, unless you're also investing in your medical engineering programs and other bits uh, to so that two, three, four, five years from now, you'll have a workforce that's able to maintain some of those sites. Great. And then our following question is, if supply chains are an issue, what other problems do we foresee, even if we manage to boost supply? Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, if we do get supply pushed forward, there are, there are some special issues, particularly with COVID, and that'll come more and more uh, later this year and, and into next year that we need to be worried about. First off is that there's been a big push by the U.S. government around, and we're talking about the, the global concerns, sort of, um, for making uh, the Pfizer uh, vaccine available globally. It's produced in, in the U.S. and the U.S. has been trying to uh, donate as much as possible uh, on that and be great if even more comes. But it uses a specialty syringe, a 0.3 mil syringe, which wasn't uh, in a lot of people's um, production lines prior to the outbreak. That also takes uh, uh, um, uh, diluents, so you need an extra syringe for that. Um, 
The other issue that we have really is that there's no coordination uh, effort on syringes like there is on vaccines. For vaccines, very early in the outbreak, sort of even in January, February, there's a big meeting at WHO. It was one of the last meetings that happened in person before uh, sort of the initial lockdown happened um, to coordinate on the COVAX mechanism, sort of a, a big funding and coordination mechanism for the production of uh, vaccines and to ensure advanced market commitments for countries that might not be able to afford them. Uh, there was no such effort for syringes. We need the same kind of push, both coordination wise and finance wise, uh, from the global health infrastructure and partners out there on syringes. Um, the, the third piece, I guess I would point to that's an issue coming up is that we will soon in 2022 have a glut of vaccines. Ironically, we're talking now and Tepicho keeps talking about you know, the vaccine inequity and access to vaccine doses and poor countries don't have them. All of that's true right now. But we even now have uh, 132 vaccines in clinical development um, that, WHO, that WHO is tracking. There's 194 additional ones in pre clinical development. So we will, there's no shortage of vaccines that are coming down the road, but if you cannot put them uh, in to get them to countries, put them in people's arms, they do no one uh, any good. And so that type of uh, issue around um, the problem being not vaccines, but actually vaccination programs and, and getting people vaccinated That'll be the big, big push through 2022. And it'll, without enough investment, it'll definitely drag things out for us. Great. And Dr. Kelly, our last question for you is, it seems as though COVID-19 will push the world to move beyond business as usual in many ways. Is there an opportunity for rethinking immunization? Yeah, I really think there is. And you know, there's there's many uh, places where COVID has pushed, um, for instance, uh, the delivery of healthcare to go much more digital and to you know to look at other ways of delivering. Um, we've realized actually that things like uh, substance abuse and mental health counseling, these types of things that were sort of shut down during the initial phases of COVID are actually essential. So many realizations we've had about aspects of healthcare, much less the, the rest of how we run societies. But I think there's really probably three, there's probably be more, but anyway, at least three big uh, items we'll realize related to vaccines and vaccinations. That's a chance for rethinking things. It's quite clear that we will not, uh, be able to vaccinate the world unless we um, change who can vaccinate. The Right now, most countries, uh, the vast, vast majority of countries, high, middle, low income, only allow medical personnel. So nurses, uh, physicians, physician assistants, in some cases, pharmacists to vaccinate. And we need to change that. Uh, there's no way we're going to reach both um, urban slum regions as well as far-flung rural areas if we don't allow community health workers to perform uh, vaccinations. And to do that, you really have to have different types of, of easy to use uh, syringes, ideally things that are single dose, ideally things, things that are pre-filled, uh, allow community health workers to do that. I think also taking it a step further, we will eventually realize that the future of vaccination, once you've made that jump to community health workers and kind of uh, social workers in the community being able to, to do these as, while they're doing other visits to families, is that families being able to self-vaccinate. You have uh, hundreds of millions of um, diabetic patients around the world that self-administer insulin. At some point, we're going to realize that in a major outbreak like this, uh, or in a biosecurity event or other things where, where you have to move uh, very quickly and get it around the world, you're going to have to have people vaccinating themselves or family members vaccinating each other. And again, you're going to have to have new ways of uh, presenting the syringe, presenting that, that vaccine to people and ways of digitally recording it 
and bringing it back up uh, into uh, the, the digital data records that are out there. So all of that is kind of a, a reinventing that is possible now. And, and I hope we get a chance to, to start to test some of those pieces. The last bit that I think will really be a rethinking um, for us on uh, vaccinations uh, coming out of COVID is partially the superimposition of COP26 and the COVID uh, outbreak. I think that people are rethinking how all business is done, much less the business of vaccination. And quite clearly, any approach on um, manufacturing, fill finish, and vaccination programs have to have upfront a focus on the environmental uh, um, uh, impact and uh, diminishing that environmental impact. And that's across the supply chain. So not just how you manufacture something, not just how you dispose of the syringe, but also transport costs um, and being able to rethink using traditional materials, uh, things, thinking of new ways to transport that are lighter and don't break, um, as well as uh, looking at, at how that uh, could potentially um, have a very positive impact coming out of COVID, not just for health, but also for the environment. Those would be my three. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly, for this wonderful and great insight. Um, and, and now I would like to direct the next set of questions to our next speaker, Omer Ahmed. Omer, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Rosh. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, fantastic. Pleasure to have you. So, Omer, our, our first question for you is, what is the consumer demand pushing for more syringes? Um, like Dr. Kelly alluded to earlier, regardless of clinical setting, folks are looking for easier to administer, easier to prepare, easier to store medication administration. So in the case in most of the developing world, we're really looking to syringes to fill a void that's being left at pharmacies, regardless of whether it's personnel shortage, space shortage, we really are looking at a landscape where physicians and other healthcare providers are looking for an easier way to administer medication to patients with less risk of error, as well as uh, less reliance on labor, which is increasingly in short supply as COVID highlighted, uh, healthcare workers were brought to the brink. And just as uh, Dr. Kelly said in his last question, if we can get more personnel to administer medication without having to reconstitute, dilute, we can just go straight to a syringe to a patient. That's just what we need to kind of increase the uptake and make sure that we have better adherence across the board, as well as just safer uh, medical practices. Great, thanks, Omer. So our following question here is, how do syringes advance healthcare? To be honest, it's really the next evolution. We've been working with intravenous medication for over a century now. And as things have progressed slowly in the world, there haven't been a ton of changes. And I think COVID is really highlighting that, you know, what worked maybe 50 years ago with a population of three and a half billion doesn't work in 2022 when we're approaching 8 billion people uh, on the globe. So really what syringes allow us to do is this next set of, we'll call it technological breakthrough, can really help expand access to medication, which has been a major issue as of late, not so much in the high income countries, but definitely in the developing world, where we see just the lack of cold chain prep, the lack of uh, proper facilities, and the lack of training has really led to an inadequacy and inequality in terms of access to healthcare. So we view you know, syringes, without syringes, we can't introduce intravenous medication into our bodies. It's just not how it works. So we really are focusing on where all the vials that we manufacture, all the ampules, all the drugs that are being made uh, for sterile intravenous use, they need to have a delivery system. And if you're not thinking of it as a total solution, then you're only seeing half the picture. So the way we view syringes is that the more products that we can put directly into syringes, as far as uh, our business is concerned, we think that allows us to not only make it a better proposition in terms of value, but also a safer overall proposition in terms of medication delivery. 
So you'll start to see in the landscape more and more this push to pre-filled syringes, auto injectors, where the delivery system and the medication have now been integrated. So as was alluded to earlier, you don't have to worry about, okay, is every vial going out with the syringe? Well, now if that's just one piece, it makes everything a lot smoother and logistics and delivery become quite a bit uh, more streamlined. Got it. So our third question, Omer, is what are the current challenges surrounding the manufacturing and distribution of pre-filled syringes? A lot of it comes down to component availability, the global shortage of various components, whether it be the syringe barrel, needles, plungers, plunger stoppers. COVID-19 really put a huge burden on an already at capacity industry and the inability to source components to actually use for uh, the filling lines, the filling lines themselves to build a fill finish facility is a three to five year project. And when we you know, go down the route of planning and trying to design these facilities, the last thing on our mind was, okay, once the facility is completed, you won't be able to get any of the components that you thought were going to be readily available at the time. So it really has changed how businesses approach just-in-time inventory, safety stock, really trying to make sure we have enough so we can deliver. Now, that's led to a global problem of either hoarding by some of the larger, uh, more industrial nations and not leaving a lot for other folks. But at the same time, all of our syringe suppliers are trying to increase production. It's just not happening fast enough. Every increase in production is already almost uh, spoken for. So we really are trying to figure out how do we continue to advance this mission without having you know a good future forecast on what the uh, supply will be. And I know the government has obviously, of all the European Western nations, have stepped in in terms of vaccine manufacturing and purchasing doses. But at, from the, our standpoint, that's an upstream uh, sort of issue. How do we go downstream? You know, the analogy I like to use is we have electric cars everywhere. Every day there's a new electric car coming out, similar to the vaccine. There's so many vaccines coming out. But have we really thought about the infrastructure, the roads that are going to drive on, the charging stations? And that's the same issue here. Have we thought about how are we actually administering these vaccines? How are we going to be filling them? Do we have vials? Do we have syringes? And that is kind of falling by the wayside because it's not necessarily headline grabbing. Those are, you know, and maybe it was the case before. Those were just assumed uh, standard categories that were going to be available. And now that those are coming into question, it'll be very interesting to see how uh, public groups as well as governments respond and if they're willing to take on this burden to help increase capacity and help increase uh, supply of these basic components. Got it. And Omer, speaking of infrastructure, how does the global supply chain both help and or hinder syringe adoption? It's helped in a way where we've had so much more access to the global labor market, global technology pool. That's really, I don't think we'd be where we are without having such a globalized industry, sourcing components from Asia, Europe, North America, all of those coming together to produce you know, a single product somewhere. And I think without that, we would never have been able to get as far as we have today. Uh, just to do various restrictions and uh, probably true of the economy overall. Now, where we run into constraints is there's different level of adoption in different countries. And we see it globally, you know, if it's Europe and they prefer ampules versus North America prefers vials, all of these kind of idiosyncrasies are kind of slowing us down. We haven't adopted really a worldwide healthcare model. The products and medication that's used in country A may not necessarily be how it's used in country B. And the products they're getting may be different. So when you start dealing with these kind of fragmented economies, it's hard to give a global solution that will solve everyone's issues. Um, you know, cold chain is not as much of an issue in Norway, for example, as it would be in Sudan. So you're really looking at problems differently. And how do you create a blanket solution? And so I think that's hindered 
some of the adoption of what we're trying to do here, which is come out with something that can work globally. Uh, when I first started, we used to make millions of doses. Now we're making hundreds of millions, hopefully billions of doses in the future. But to do that, you need some sort of economies of scale. And I think that's been a big issue as we've seen with the vaccine is that with COVID, you know, different countries, there's a lot of politics involved in terms of which vaccines are used where, how are they administered? And so that sort of inequity is definitely gonna lead towards different issues regarding how do we get one blanket solution across the board? Got it. And along that same supply chain question, what initiatives can governments take to secure the syringe supply chain? I think a lot of it comes down to long-term investment. Um, there's a lot of headlines out there about grant money going for, you know, buying these doses, building this production facility. And, you know, those are all great. They're all necessary. Um, but these are very long-term projects. We need to not be thinking about necessarily COVID-19 today, but, you know, God forbid COVID 2030 or, you know, all down the line, this is not going to be, I'm sure Dr. Hilly will speak, could speak to this, the last pandemic we see here. And we definitely need to focus on how do we build an ecosystem, right? We want local production across the world, but that requires an ecosystem of trained personnel, trained maintenance folks, bringing in that infrastructure, reliable power so that you can actually have local production. And these are taken for granted in the industrialized world, but we need to really understand that to increase supply of pre-filled syringes, vaccines, medications, it's not just we're gonna put up a building and then all of a sudden it'll start producing medication. That's not necessarily how it works. You really need the personnel is what really makes it. The technology can be great. We can have the finest technology, finest machinery, but if we don't have trained workforce, um, not a lot's gonna get out of that facility. And that requires a long-term investment from governments, not just a short-term shot in the arm of cash. We really need to look at what can we handle much more broadly on a macro level so that the whole world has access to medication, you know, during these sorts of uh, acute events. Great. And our final question for you, Omer, is what have we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and how can this help us in the future? I think we've learned that we're not as prepared as we ever think we are. Um, this is not something anybody could have ever predicted. And it essentially exacerbated our worst fears in terms of where do we fall short. And I think we're really learning that our healthcare system overall is not as resilient as maybe we had hoped it was in the face of such a crisis. Now, I think our response has been quite admirable. We were able to create vaccines, medication, ramp up supply in such a short amount of time, but at what cost? It did come at a cost. There were externalities in terms of what was left behind, what other medications, immunizations, other services were unavailable because we had to respond uh, with such force here. So I think we've learned that nothing comes without a cost. We couldn't just magically create uh, vaccines and their corresponding downstream supply without it sacrificing some of the other uh, portions of the healthcare system. So I think what we're really learning is we need to do more and have that availability and they have that flexibility and understand both from a regulatory public um, domain as well as private businesses that things can change so quickly overnight, we need to be flexible, whether it was working from home, whether it's totally retooling a uh, production line. It really comes down to the countries and the businesses that will be the most successful are the ones that are the most flexible. And I think that's probably been the biggest lesson learned uh, post COVID. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Omer, for this great insight. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for participating and Apiject for presenting today's Fierce Pharma webinar. I'd also like to thank everyone for attending and submitting so many great questions. We unfortunately did run out of time to take additional questions, but we will try our best to get back to everyone who submitted personally after the webinar. Please note that this webinar has been recorded you will be able to access the recording within 24 hours using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Thank you again for joining, and we look forward to seeing you at future events.